Well, everyone, welcome to today's uh, webinar from the Open Group. Um, today's event has been brought to us by a very active member of the Open Group, and our speaker today is Craig Martin. Uh, first of all, we would encourage you to ask questions. It's a really good opportunity to uh, uh, ask questions. And what we'll do is we'll try and ask as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. So, Craig, if you're ready, can I ask you to start your presentation? Yes, thanks, Simon. So what we wanted to discuss today was really around the practice of architecture. Um, in other words, how do we build um, effective architectural practices in uh, some interesting changing uh, market dynamics. Um, so I'm going to touch on some dimensions of that today. Um, but really just a quick blurb of who AEA is. So some of you may know us, so we, we, do, we are a global organization and we specifically focus within the niche um, architecture discipline and that's from enterprise business right down to solution infrastructure, those aspects. So we do have a global footprint um, and that runs across uh, strategy consulting, uh, practice development, uh, which also includes um, resourcing and training and skilling as well as creating um, practices and service model design. Um, and developing architectural operating models. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be discussing um, today in today's session. Right, so let's head straight into it. And I always preface uh, a talk I do with this diagram for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, I find it very, very relevant in the separation between the intuitive thinking and analytical thinking space. And what you see running across it there in that little pyramid, so to speak, is, a, is what I refer to as a knowledge funnel. Uh, and the knowledge funnel which takes these unresolved business challenges on the right-hand side and has to push them through a series of um, processes, techniques, methods, whatever we want to call it, frameworks, to come up to these robust, repeatable, and replicable, rep replicable processes on the left-hand side. And ultimately, that is our discipline. Um, this discipline of architecture is to take these business challenges, help our business sponsors understand them better, and push them through this knowledge funnel far more effectively um, to be able to get to this repeatability. And you'll see I refer to that as exploitation and reliability as opposed to exploration and validity. So I'm going to keep referring back to this, and but a lot of the architectural discipline has to do a lot with what we see on the left-hand side, which is very analytical-based discipline. Now, why is that relevant? Well, really what we see occurring is uh, a shift um, within the market, and you're probably all aware of it. Um, this is a traditional view of strategic importance and value versus complexity. And really what you have at the top right, and you can overlay on this processes, you can overlay capabilities, um, you can even overlay applications and those types of things on it, but we only like to overlay a series of capabilities on this, on this matrix. And what it talks about is this top right quadrant, which is highly valuable but highly complex. And that's the mergers and acquisitions. That's the area where you can't actually define processes because it's in such a state of flux. And then what we have to do is we have to effectively, as we understand the space better, we have to move it using the knowledge funnel down into the bottom right and start to identify what are referred to as core competitive capabilities or competencies. Now, at that point is where we start to sweat what we know about it and we start to build repeatable processes. We start to understand more about how we can sweat it and squeeze the maximum out of those processes. And ultimately, and that's where we use Six Sigma Lean, Theory of Constraints, all of those different techniques. Now ultimately, um, once we've sweated everything we can out of those processes, we will then push it to the bottom left quadrant, which is all about automation. Um, and then to the top left quadrant, which is we pretty much outsource it and we push it out for other providers to, to handle for us. Now, what we're actually seeing is that um, that space on the left-hand side is getting bigger, faster. In other words, the things that used to differentiate us in the past are now becoming fairly commonplace, and I'll refer to that as utility. Um, so the pace at which we have to take these innovative ideas and push them through this knowledge funnel into this highly repeatable sort of block on the bottom left there that's getting bigger, um, well, that pace has to increase. Uh, and that is really our job as architects to try and facilitate that increase in efficiency. Um, and the challenge is, well, is that top right quadrant getting more frenetic? Is that innovation space getting a lot more um, competitive? And yeah, I, I, I definitely say it is. It's 
especially considering the demand for things like innovation frameworks um, and uh, innovation methods and techniques, ideation technologies, Joy's law, the ability to extract information from people that aren't your employees, all of that type of stuff is everyone trying to innovate more effectively in the top right quadrant. But the breakdown occurs in the shifting of those ideas into this into the reliability space, and that's where the architectural space actually sits. Now, what we're actually seeing, and this is how we, we, we refer to a business model, by the way, which is a market model, a products and services model, and an operating model, what we're seeing is that that's actually getting put, getting put under a lot of pressure. If we look from the bottom upwards, which is the operating model space, a lot of the traditional space that architecture tended to play in, which was the technology area, is, a lot, is, being, out, is being outsourced. You know, it's being pushed to the cloud. Uh, people that used to get high salaries for doing those jobs, uh, we can now push it out to um, a much more efficient um, support base uh, sitting out of a, an, a, another country. Um, and uh, pay a lot less for those services. Um, so a lot of those aspects, the technology applications, you know, information as a service, platform as a service, all those things are being pushed out. But what we're also seeing up at the top is a awareness of business people around technology. Uh, and we see this when we have to do things like a digital strategy, um, where it's very difficult for a digital team to actually uh, have have much say in what the business wants to do because everyone in the business who's so used to digital technology thinks that they know the, the, the most about digital and yeah. have an opinion to state about it. Whereas not everyone has an opinion to state about how to originate home loans, for example. Um, so there's this pressure from business people getting to know and understand technology more and also begin to apply a lot of the techniques like business architecture techniques, kind of squishing it in the middle there. And this kind of begs the question around what, what role is there for the architect, and what role is there for the business architect in that particular discipline. Hopefully we'll get to the end of this presentation I might be able to answer some of those questions. So what we're also seeing is this uh, shift in sort of broader economic models, the creative common uh, models, which basically talks about this, the fact that human knowledge is becoming more and more util utility. And this space at the bottom is growing and growing. Um, to the point where the innovator, assemble and mix aspects that I need to be able to do are actually becoming more my differentiator. So if we as architects are playing in this bottom space, which is the utility and foundation area, we're actually in danger of becoming dinosaurs. Um, and we really need to identify and uh, skill ourselves up into this innovator, assemble and mix space. We really look at, okay, but once I have the utility, how can I mix those aspects more effectively in order to get, deliver the advantages the business is looking for? Um, and uh, not only must I be aware of everything on the utility layer, I also need to understand how to apply it and adapt it for those particular business needs. And we see that quite often. I mean, I was just looking at um, the APQC a couple of weeks ago, and you, know, you, you can see that a lot of the utility space is becoming freely available. The things and capability models and, and uh, operating models and business models that you know we used to you know, pay a lot of money for in the past, those things are becoming utility. And now I can go and get a, an enterprise architecture management process framework from uh, APQC, and I can leverage that into my environment. So now those things are becoming standard, co commonplace, and utility. And we're in danger of, of this um, utility space sort of getting left a little behind um, in that we're, we're, we're so focused on all just those building blocks of a business and the building blocks of architecture that we're actually kind of losing uh, focus on what the demands are from a business perspective around the innovator symbol and mix space. And we see that through a few reports. So this one is from um, the corporate executive board, okay, which kind of looks at, well, where are the top sort of CEO um, demands or the drivers that they're looking for. So customer loyalty is the top there, increasing flexibility and speed. And then you kind of get to reducing costs and increasing innovation. Now that increasing innovation would actually change a little this report's only two years old. So th th there is a separation between what the CEO sees as a driver versus what the CEO is seeing as a driver. And a lot of what the CIO challenges are faced with are predominantly sitting within the reducing costs area in that efficiency space. And we kind of see this in this report from Infotech as well, which looks at the, the gap that exists between the CEO and the CIO landscape. And you can kind of see that 
is a large gap between the CEO um, seeing that, it, that one of these key drivers is maximizing stakeholder value, not shareholder value, shareholder value is inside stakeholder value. Um, so there's a large gap, 25 points, between the, the, whether the CIO sees that as valuable versus whether the CEO sees that as valuable. Um, and then you can see down the bottom there are things like managing risk, um, in which there is a you know, fairly large awareness that the CIO needs to manage risk, uh, but really not seen as a main driver uh, for the CEO, which is sort of an interesting view. You know, we all sort of the perception that's all about risk management, but I suppose depending on the industry you're in, I suppose if, if there was a government client, for example, you'd expect that managing risk piece to be a lot higher with regards to the business leadership. But all this is communicating is that there is a gap between the traditional CIO view of the world in which the architecture discipline traditionally sits underneath that CIO space and some of the pressures that are now being faced by the CEO um, and the business units. And, and really, if, if, if history is anything to go by, you know, there's actually not a good legacy out there. 46% of business failures are misguided strategies. More than half of all business projects are failing. One third of firms fail to achieve expected results. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of interesting reports. I'll refer to another graph later just around um, how many projects do not meet business and CEO expectations. So there's this misalignment occurring across this process of us taking the complex problem space in the knowledge funnel and pushing them all the way through to delivery on the back end. Um, and there's a broken series of chains along that whole area. And really, you know, the, the proof that the pudding isn't eating, as they say. So, so you can see here from the capability coherence score from that article um, from the Harvard Business Review, mm -hmm. if I'm able to achieve that synergy, um, in other words, create suitable co coherency or linkage from my market model, my products and services down into my operating model space and start to actually get the organization um, to be able to work as one, being able to push those complex ideas through the knowledge funnel more effectively. There's a distinct um, and tangible value and impact on my business by pushing up the EBIT. So these are the, this is the, the, the proof of those types of organizations that have a high coherency proof. In other words, their capabilities are mixed in the just the right way to have um, high value results on their financial reports. And the problem that we often find, right, and especially with the architecture discipline, is this concept of a mandate. This diagram is a little crowded, but really what this talks about is this journey that the architecture discipline has had um, from its origins within the IT space and as it begins to move up the curve. And uh, we deal with projects that sit right across that spectrum. So, you know, there are the normal arc EA IT architecture space, which sits at the point A, moving up into the broader ERP-based stuff, you know, large-scale transformations at an IT level sitting at B. My business is losing, you know, 20 million a quarter, find out why and fix it, um, which is improving business performance creating optimized product portfolios and product architecture, product bundling, um, linking design thinking, customer experience, those things uh, all take place in um, phase D. And then right up into improving market performance, which is E, which is all about the mergers and uh, acquisitions, things like cost to income ratio, shareholder value. Now the tools that you need across that entire spectrum are vastly different. I mean, me building an architectural practice um, that requires uh, that need, need, needing to provide services for M and A activities quite different from building an architectural practice that is needing to do desktop support and idle based um, support within the organisation. So there's quite a spectrum that the discipline needs to operate on. And what we've actually found in dealing with clients is that they spread themselves too thin over this spec this uh, mandate curve, um, realizing that they need to be providing this value in the top section. Um, but then also realizing that they still need to provide what we refer to as the utility down here in sort of the A and B space. And we see architectural teams completely maxed out, sitting thin across this entire spectrum. Um, and, and really you have to sort of pick your battles very carefully around which projects you want to take on if you have a vision of moving up this particular curve. Um, because you really what you're focusing on is going from the predictable utility space right up into sort of more influencing strategy, and which is seen as a frontier bit of the architectural discipline. 
um, and focusing on, on really helping the business define their strategies. And uh, we can see this as well from you know the, the report from Infotech. You can kind of see here is that well you know the CEO's actual experience of the architecture and specifically the IT space sitting with the CIO level is that it keeps business happy, keep costs low. It's all about cost efficiency and support. Whereas in actual fact, the CEO's optimal view of where he would like the CIO's office to help the C, uh, within the technology space is to extend, help extending business into new areas and generating revenue. And then you can see kind of in the middle there is where the CIO as is versus future states is currently playing out, uh, which is really in that optimized increasing efficiency and decreased cost space. So from this, you can actually see there's still, once again, quite a gap between what the CEO sees as an optimal view of what the CIO and architecture and IT can do for him versus actually what the CIO thinks is optimal, which is, which is interesting, but it's kind of telling, well, do you have the mandate to do the things that business is looking for? Well, according to this, the CEO is saying that, yes, I'm expecting you. That's the level I want to operate at. Um, but perhaps the mandate hasn't been given to that CIO to begin to operate at that, and therefore it chooses a fairly low level CIO optimal point that he can target and work with. So there's a few causes that uh, kind of linger around that space um, which cause that, and I've, um, it's a separate presentation which I think I've, I've, I've already delivered. But what we found quite interesting was you know, this world of the CIO, and uh, last year there was, uh, actually was it last year, I think it was this year, um, where there was an award for the CIO of the year. And I took a pho we took a photograph of the screen because we found it quite interesting because it was actually the chief digital officer that won the CIO of the year award um, and not actually what somebody would classify as a traditional CIO, which kind of tells you that there's a shift occurring within that space and, well, what is the role of the architecture discipline to try and help that? Can we see this as a threat or an opportunity for our function, especially considering the sort of vice grip on the discipline, the pressure which our discipline is under with you know, cloud and all those things sort of gobbling up the bottom there and coming from the top, you know, you've got the pressure of business people knowing and understanding these spaces better and understanding technology better uh, and applying their own decision-making frameworks to how they want technology implemented within their different business units. So I um, just want to touch lightly on some of those who um, aspects. In other words, who's responsible for this? Uh, and I don't say to about a particular individual. I want to talk about disciplines within a business. And um, this particular one is a view of a business model. We presented this to a bank some time ago, um, in, which, in which there was clear ownership of what we refer to as the strategic architecture mandate, um, which is all about products and services, the market model space, and then clear ownership below that of the sort of IT architecture mandate, which was the, the, the um, CIO space. But there was a very sort of large area in the middle there that linked these together in which there didn't seem to be a clear mandate or a clear ownership of who was responsible for that. N not, ne never mind just that piece there, but also just the functional and cross-functional bits on the side. In other words, who in the business is actually responsible for, for linking it all together? And, and this is a clear gap that I'm seeing in industry. And I'm often left wondering why the architecture discipline is not filling that gap as well as it should. And there's probably a few of you on the call who, who, who may be sitting within that role, but really the ability for you to sit up at the strategic enterprise design planning space and have the ability to link it all the way through all of the disciplines, all the way down the stack. Um, and that's the role of the EA. It's not an IT person. You've probably heard me reinforce this over and over again. It's not an IT discipline. It's the job to actually link all of these aspects together to bring context to business. And the problem with that is, is there's this confusion around disciplines. You know, whose job is it to do that? You know, if we look at from strategic planning, you know, planning discipline right to delivering and operating. I've just gone through an exercise with the bank now looking at their architectural practice as they are being pulled into delivery and operating the, the bank. Um, and you've got these senior architects who um, are, being, are turning away strategic planning opportunities because they're too entrenched in projects to deliver and, and show the value of the things that they, that they originally architected. Um, and, and thereby you know, forcing business to go elsewhere and, and look for help 
outside of the organization. So there is a distinct lack of clarity often around who does what, where does responsibility start and end within the organization, specifically when it comes to the types of disciplines that you and I are traditionally used to. Um, and an enterprise design one is really one that we're spending a lot of time focusing on, which is all around how do we take an architecture discipline and merge human-centered design around it um, and start to build in design thinking and a number of those aspects around um, people focus. So really enterprise design is a combination of traditional architectural business architecture thinking on one side and then the human-centered design thinking on the other and merging these two in the middle to, to, to create a more human-centered design, so to speak, for the architecture that we develop. And then you can kind of see where a few of the other disciplines also sit. And normally what happens is we, we get this misalignment from strategy right the way through to projects. Um, and, and we often see this echoed in a series of concerns that we hear from our stakeholders. And here's an example of a smattering of some of them. Are we investing in the right areas across the business? You know, are the strategic programs aligned? Are we actually doing the right things out there? There's so much activity. How do we even know that those are the right things that we're doing? And, 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 look, and seeing through the eyes of the project management office, um, PMO is, is, is not well equipped to be able to respond to some of these questions because they do look through a time, cost, and effort lens. Um, they are also driven by quarterly reporting. Um, so their paradigm is quite different from, for example, an architectural discipline whose paradigm is actually more longer term, three to five years. So there's this conflict occurring between this quarterly reporting that I have to do for the share market versus you know, building something that is sustainable and reusable on an ongoing basis. And this tends to lead to you know, this, this gap that exists between what the strategy is looking for and ultimately the projects that deliver those. Now, there's a variety of reasons which cause that, but let me just focus on the architectural ones that I see occurring. Um, and really, this occurs predominantly. This scenario one is the dominant scenario that occurs in business. And that says, OK, we've got the mission, vision, strategy. There's the motivation model on the left. And coming out of that, you know, executives will come back after a day-long strategy day and produce a series of initiatives. Those initiatives are handed off to different business units, and those business units go off and bring in their particular consultants that they work with, their teams that they work with, build, build business models and solutions based upon those initiatives. And we lose coherency. Loss of coherency occurred way up at the strategy level because we didn't have a unifying business model a unifying understanding of how all the capabilities could fit together to create the value that um, the business was looking for. And it kind of fragmented early on in the cycle. And that normally occurs when we see the discipline stacking up in this following fashion, um, in which we see architecture. And look, you know, we can put business architecture in there, and we can put enterprise architecture in there, but let's just call it the architecture discipline in which coming out of the strategic and business planning exercise, initiatives are given to PMO, they drive it, and often architecture is seen as almost an afterthought or a rubber stamp or something that you need to just get through and manage the architects through that cycle. Now, that leads to you know, results such as this, which kind of look at, you can see, look at the big 35% there, dark blue, that's the CEO's perspective. Projects did not meet business expectations. So 35% of projects didn't meet business expectations. Um, you've got some, you've got 50% on the one side, but what's interesting here is the disparity between what the CEO sees as, as successful versus what the CIO saw as successful. Um, so, you know, the CIO on the left project exceeded business expectation. You know, the 10% of the group that was polled felt that, you know, that 10% were met on, not 10%, but the group that was polled, 10% met those business expectations. But the CEO feels that, well, only 5% exceeded those expectations. So you can see, once again, the echo of at this project landscape, the difference between what a CEO sees as successful versus what the CIO sees as successful which clearly shows that there's a gap in language somewhere. What's going on here? Why are we delivering projects at the PMO project level and the business is not seeing the value from those projects? And so, so let's move to the next, the next scenario to see how that could play out then in order to deal with some of those issues. And that's really around business transition space. Um, where you go through the same exercise, do your motivation, but instead of necessarily producing a series of initiatives, 
Uh, coming out of that, you'll produce a series of capabilities or capability increments. And that will help you define what we refer to as the business model. Uh, in other words, how do all of these pieces stitch together from differentiating capabilities to competing capabilities to just foundational capabilities? How do they stitch together to give me the value that I'm looking for across my business? And then on the back of that, what, how can I produce a roadmap and uh, to break that roadmap down into um, the different business units? in a more planned, architected fashion. And the way that that works is effectively moving the architecture space above the PMO space. Um, in other words, they're allowing architecture, the, the headroom to architect and plan for the business um, and deliver the, a roadmap that the PMO team can take forward. Now, the challenge here is that the architecture discipline must stop being so purist to a certain extent, um, is that we do take quite a bit of time to get through this exercise. So you have to increase your efficiency. If you want to head into this space and play in the space, you have to push stuff through that knowledge funnel much more effectively, or rather so much more efficiently than, than what has traditionally occurred. Um, and if you're spreading your team thin across the mandate curve, you're not going to be able to do that. So you've got to choose your battles pretty carefully. You've got to choose how you allocate um, your resources across the project space. You've got to manage supply and demand of your resources far more effectively uh, um, across that mandate curve in order to do this. Don't jump into this space because you're not going to be able to deliver on time is, is often what occurs. You damage your reputation as an architecture function and you're kind of once again relegated under the project management where they can crack the whip. So, so that's that sort of the, the space of pulling architecture above. And then there's a few others which I'll just skip through quite quickly. So this one relates to you know even going further up the stack. Um, architecture getting involved in the business planning and strategic planning space um, in which you can actually go and produce a series of business models or business scenarios that you can play out in the business and overlay a whole bunch of content on it to really show the business or which of these sort of business models is more effective for you, which one can you achieve with your current investment, current tactical pressures, and your current maturity and strengths and weaknesses. And then off the back of that, the business making a decision on which of those models is more effective, which one they'd like to play out. And they're kicking that off through a series of projects and that sort of transformational type projects. And um, the value here is that you've really done the architecture. You've really understood the implication of the business. You're one step ahead of the curve. Once again, you can see in the little graph on the top right, you must be equipped to be able to do this. You can't go and play in this pond without the efficiency to be able to deliver the outcomes that the business department is looking for. And if we are still playing around in that utility layer, we haven't defined the utility effectively enough to deliver against this mandate, then once again we're going to lose reputation because we're not going to be able to deliver it on time for business at an architectural level. And that, and that kind of looks to this model here, which is our architecture moves sort of further up into that particular stack, um, into, the, into sitting between strategic planning and the business planning area. Um, and really this is where this model starts to take shape. Um, which I thought was some good research. It's a little dated now and probably needs a bit of an update, but uh, I've seen it uh, pop itself up in uh, some, some reports along the way. And it, what it does is it matches the economic life cycle um, to the stock cycle and then also to the types of models that were deployed at different parts of the economic cycle. So you can see that as you have an upward trend in the economic cycle, there's a variety of models over time as businesses have matured, they've begun to, to do. Um, way back in the sort of 1975s, only as companies were going down into a recession did they start to boot up a cost model and then a services model to start to optimize costs to try and um, help them out of the recession. And that occurred again in 1980 in that global recession. Um, only towards the 1990s space did suddenly people start to build new service models before the decline started to occur. And then as the decline was occurring, suddenly a whole bunch of different ways of rebooting their businesses began to occur. Um, all different tools and techniques to try and do it. And you can see that that has matured quite a bit. There's lots of activity looking at the 2000.com uh, crisis and then also the 2007 you can see that business is maturing in its understanding of the things that it needs to do to prepare for these types of crashes. And they, they do occur, there's a pattern that occurs, and you can see 
and that those curves are getting closer and closer. So the ability for us as a business to be able to produce these types of models, these changes to business in a much more efficient in a way, is going to be the task of the architecture function to, 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 to try and facilitate, let's call use of that word facilitate. Um, especially if those curves are starting to get closer and closer, which means we have to move through those funnels a whole lot faster in playing out those different models. And that's really what occurs both within the, that particular space of the um, architecture discipline sitting between strategic and business planning, as well as now within this enterprise design space, looking at how we can get a more human-centered human approach um, to dealing with, with the, um, the, um, our customers, our employees, and how they interact with the building blocks of our organization. And really, that's one area that I might just want to touch on as well, is this concept of an architecture services design, which really looks at, well, you know, when we build an architectural practice, and this is something we do for a number of our clients, is we now begin to take more of a service design-based approach, in which we look at um, the employee experience of the actual practice, and then we look at customer experience on the one side and figure out, well, how can the architectural practice design services that benefit the customer? Um, and often we look through the lens of the, of the actual customer, not just the internal customer. So how can me developing blueprints and roadmaps benefit uh, a customer who has to draw money at an ATM or a customer that has to... Um, send a parcel from one place to another, or you know, a customer that has to release a new digital product within a certain time span. I mean, what type of services can we provide that are actually going to help customers achieve those outcomes? And this is a sort of people-centered and human-centered design approach um, that we've found to be quite successful in a, in a number of our global clients. Um, what we've also found to be quite good is to build what we refer to as these cross-functional and cross-discipline teams. Um, the problem with architecture isn't the fact that we don't know um, our own backyard, so to speak. Uh, we have methods, we have frameworks, we have a whole bunch of things that we, that we can call upon that help us in that utility space. Uh, we often see the breakdown occurring more between the disciplines. Um, and that's, that's, sort of, um, that's the TOGAS model at the bottom here talking about the different disciplines. And the breakdown occurs in the relationship between EA, SA, solution development, between project and portfolio management, all of those aspects. And, and what we've seen quite successful, successfully implemented is um, if you find the other disciplines in your organization that are also looking to operate horizontally across the organization. In other words, the finance team, well, guess what? They've got to look right across the entire enterprise and stitch it all together. So they're trying to get an enterprise view right across. And they're trying to optimize um, their organization to create greater business insights. Uh, well, there's also the strategy team. They're looking horizontally across the business. There's the business improvement team. They're looking horizontally. There's the technology team under the CIO norm. That's looking horizontally. PMO looking horizontally. Change manager. They're all looking, the ones that tend to operate horizontally across an org structure as opposed to the vertical view. Get, the, get them in a team together. Call it an IBB team, a business planning team, an enterprise planning team, whatever the case might be. They're all trying to achieve the same outcomes, is to create coherency across the assets that run across the organization. One of the reasons that prevents us from moving effectively through that knowledge funnel is that all of the aspects of capability are not dealt with when architects do capability-based planning. They tend to focus only on technology. Well, guess what? Capabilities, people, process, tools, and information to drive out a certain outcome. All right? And have a look at that team. That team constitutes those types of people. Um, so creating a team that is a combination of those disciplines to be able to produce the outcomes that business is looking for, is, 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 I've seen that work quite successfully. All right, so what, what does this mean from an architectural practice perspective? So let's look at the business of architecture. Um, uh, we did start 10 minutes late, so I think I've got enough time. But we might go over nine, uh, but it will be recorded and it will be on slides here for you to look at later. So if you have to go at nine, um, thanks for attending. Um, so into this architecture practice maturity space, there's sort of two levels that you have to operate. You can go vertically into this level of architectural thinking, uh, which is this ivory tower on the top left, you know, bright guys sitting in a dark room somewhere staring at their navels, so to speak. 
um, but the business doesn't know what happens there and the magic happens supposedly. Right? Versus the bottom right one which is we do architecture but really only at a project level um, and really kind of it's quite fragmented. So that's, what we've got to do is we've actually got to traverse this graph uh, in a fairly clever way because you don't want to do too much vertical up into the ivory tower space. You want to be able to increment up and then deliver the value, increment up and deliver the value, increment up and deliver the value. And that's what you have to try and do over, over a series of, of months. And uh, I will be honest with you, I haven't seen that somebody trying to move up that mandate curve up into the um, phase E of the mandate curve right up at the top in mergers and acquisitions, 12 to 18 month window, um, which sounds long all right, considering that we have to move fast. But there's a lot of politics that seems to play out, especially in the corporate space. Obviously, depending upon industry, that can happen quicker, um, but you also lose credibility quicker if you don't do it right. So, you know, there's a window that you need to operate with as you move up this curve. And this is one of the, our, our own internal mechanism on how we do the business of architecture by looking at the motivation of the architectural practice specifically related to the mandate curve, what services they provide, and we present that through a catalog and a communication plan, or what capabilities do I need within my practice to be able to deliver those services? In other words, the individuals, the skills, uh, looking at a demand analysis, demand and supply, sourcing, producing a roadmap, and governing that roadmap going forward. So this is EA's little me a method that we use specifically to design architectural practices that get you to that top mandate curve, uh, and building a roadmap to help you get there. And I'll take you through kind of a couple of the slides that lead you through that. So here's an example of a few. So you have the practice motivation model, and then we look at we use the motivation model, which looks at well where we provide value, and on the back of that we design a series of services, we produce internal communications packs, and then ultimately a capability model looking at the people, process, and tools of the practice to deliver those services and deliver the value required in the motivation model, and then it goes through an exercise of assessing our own internal capability and optimizing the architectural operating model, specifically looking at things like demand and supply management, which tends to be a problem because the resources required to operate at that phase, the mandate E level, are fairly limited compared to um, perhaps some that are sort of further down that mandate curve. So you have to figure out how to spread your resources effectively and, and or even if you want to operate up in that, that top mandate area and ultimately producing a sourcing strategy and a practice improvement roadmap. So yeah, it's just a, a mock-up of a strategy and architecture motivation model. We use the business motivation model to document all strategies for business and internally. So we drink our own champagne, what we do for business. You will do for your architectural practice, looking at the external drivers and some of the goals and objectives required for that architectural practice to be able to deliver the value that business is looking for. Um, we use a variety of um, co-design techniques. Uh, these are all Creative Commons, by the way. You can, you can download these fairly freely. Understanding how these link, however, to a products and services model, understanding how they link to the business model canvas, all those things. Um, we, we, we do train people on those techniques. Um, so you know, here it's understanding, well, who's the customer? You know, what is the sort of empathy map that we can work with to begin to follow a human-centered design approach? and then ultimately building a value proposition canvas of how they interact with our internal products and services, specifically at an architectural level, and then ultimately building out a service model, but really looking at that sort of design thinking and co-design aspects um, to try and get a, a better understanding. Because architects do like to do things in a room and then emerge with a sort of a ta-da effect at the end of it. And that's that way of designing and I, I make that mistake often because we tend to be those types of thinkers. Um, you know, that way of designing and doing architecture, it needs to, we need to move on from that. And we need to get into this co-design space and the creative commons because there are, our business sponsors have access to all of these tools themselves and they're doing it themselves and sometimes not correctly. So instead of getting on our high horse and trying to have control over that domain, we should, we should become the facilitators of it more effectively across the organization. And that's a lot of the sort of human-centered co-design aspects. And what that produces is a series of services. You know, here's the team, here's a sort of top-level strategy and developer blueprint management, roadmap management services that are provided through the architecture team to deal with those particular drivers and the ultimate goals that we're looking to achieve. And this is really our aspirations on a page. 
specifically aligned to some of the goals that would come out from a business perspective. Um, these tools, you know, it's just a model, that's all it is. And it's a different view of looking at where value lies in the organization and how I provide that value as an architectural practice. But I, we often don't see these documented for an architectural practice. We don't see them developing these types of models to actually communicate to business. Well, these are the services we provide, and these are the things that are going to help you with. Um, and allow those customers to actually um, be involved in the process of co-designing those services with you, uh, not based upon what you think is good to offer them, but based upon what they actually need. In other words, the demand pool as opposed to the supply pool. Huge area in which I think the architecture discipline is really weak in is you know the ability to to communicate these strategies more effectively and do yourself a favor get yourself a good designer on board uh, that understands emotive factors around visualization uh, understands aspects of communicating messages to a broader business these things are extremely valuable we live in a generation of business people that are used to the eye candy they're seeing on the app store uh, and they're expecting that level of eye candy back from the rest of the of the of the, of the organization and sometimes the models that architects produce are are, are scary um, for lack of a better word. So there is a lot around the communication strategy and communicating the services and the value that you provide to those particular stakeholders. And producing a communication manual, even down to branding and coloring system and looking at different types of colors and the types of emotions that those things work with within your stakeholders. All of those are, are needed disciplines within the, the co-design and service design space. Right, it's, I think uh, just finishing off to this one, if I recall, um, just kind of drilling a little bit down into a little bit of the how space. And we're all familiar with the wagon wheels or the crop circles. Um, but really, just there's two hats that you have to wear. Um, and I often find, you know, it's like, kind of like the bonus six hat thinking. You know, you've got to kind of put different hats on at different stages. Um, and as an architect, you've got to wear two different hats here. You've got to wear this business hat, and you have to wear this architect's hat. Um, and often, we go into a business meeting, we'll be wearing the wrong hat and communicating the wrong messages. We've all been there. We've all used all the architecture jargon, and you know, we've had people staring back at us and the crickets chirping in the background. Top of story. Um, so, you know, there's some lessons learned around well, how do we communicate more effectively to business and the value that we provide to business? And there's this method of execution right, in finding the right tools, not the standard stuff that I talk to you about. Yes, there are building blocks that frameworks and those provide, but you have to find, in conjunction with your business sponsors, uh, in conjunction even with your customers, what tools actually work for them? What models really work for them to answer the types of questions that they do? And, and, and this is an area which we don't see much of. I mean, Togev talks about it. It talks about concerns-based architecture. It talks about views and viewpoints and how to use those. And yet, strangely enough, out of the entire framework, it's the piece that we see the least used uh, amongst the community of architects who do, do, do tend to produce a lot of what we call wallware. Nice diagrams, but you know who's the consumer, and what of what relevance is it? You know, and once again, I've made the same mistake. We've all we've all been there, and we we suffer from that thing because we think it's cool. Uh, but there is an aspect of you know leaving that legacy behind and getting more into the, you know, the, the 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 pocket, so to speak, of the business people, and understanding which models and tools and techniques you can actually apply within that particular space. And then ultimately, there's the traditional architecture hack. But really, at the end of the day. I've got to give a model that a solution architect can take forward. And if either have a, an enterprise architect that's too detailed and is, is disconnected from the business, or you have an a enterprise architect that's not detailed enough and is, too, is quite immersed in strategic planning the business, but whatever they produce for the solution architect isn't of adequate um, detail for them to carry their job forward. And a bunch of reinvention occurs, and guess what? We lose compliance. Um, and suddenly, they start doing things which really weren't on the roadmap and plan, leading to cases of business not seeing the value that they were promised. So there is this, this balance that you need to do, and it takes a really good EA to be able to work between these two hats that they need to be able to wear. And that's something that I think you can practice within your own community. And just, just talk to your customers. What works for them, what doesn't. You present something to them. 
you know, put it up on the wall and ask them, hey, does this float your boat or doesn't it? You know, and a and, you know, large portion of the time people will look at you and say, I have no idea what you're actually showing on the wall. That means nothing to me. And you need to go through the process of iterating through that. You know? Now, by all means, this isn't, isn't something I would show a business sponsor. Right? This is something that I would develop for a internal practice. Um, as, I, as I began to understand, all right, um, building an enterprise and pro do process modeling, but the detail required all right, for uh, a level below me. And I think that often I see it in the architects, they, they're not quite sure how to connect it all together. So when I produce models, I have to produce them that a solution architect or an application architect or an information architect can actually consume. But the business architect often won't necessarily understand that space enough and therefore produce models that are too high level. So an important lesson for each of us is that you have to understand upstream and downstream from your role. What is it that works for them and what doesn't work for them? Um, don't just focus on the upstream, but is that where your, your bonus comes from? But really it's all about tr creating the linkage between these disciplines. All right, and then we get into strategy and, and architecture teams, right? And this is where we look at um, uh, org structure. We look at the capabilities of an architectural practice. Um, we look at um, the products and services that are provided. So now it's, okay, we've defined the services model. We've defined the motivation that needed to occur. Now we have to produce a series of capabilities to deliver that. And this is where we do things like capability maturity assessment, using some of the well-known maturity assessment frameworks out there that really deal with looking at your internal practice. Where is it strong? Where is it weak? Where do I need to complement my, my teams and my organization? And, and you know, another lesson to call out here is, is often we see um, architectural practices building and designing service models and but not investing enough time in the capability space and understanding their capability areas and effectively improving internal capability. It kind of everyone's left to do their own things and just provide those services. So it is an exercise as an architecture manager that you would need to go through um, in order to be able to deliver the value to, your, to those end customers. And then we overlay a whole bunch of team capability on here looking at primary responsibilities. It's another view of a race, so to speak. Um, but once again, models are good at communicating complexity which we, as architects, tend to bury in our spreadsheets. So, you know, looking at capability and team roles overlay onto your capability model. Everyone knows what they need to do, what projects they can turn away, what projects they need to take on. And then ultimately going down into this demand analysis space in which we look at ways in which we can take the capabilities of our architectural practice and the services and how often those services are required by a business, who are the stakeholders that are calling for those services, um, and how often does it occur and can I begin to do a proper demand and, and, and supply management exercise of my resources? Because often this is where the, the wheels come off because our guys and our team and our, uh, are too thinly spread across that mandate curve. So it's important to have a manager in charge of this area that is able to allocate those resources to the right area. And this sounds like common knowledge. You know, it sounds like, well, surely this is how all teams are run. This is how I schedule and manage my team. And yet we find it actually, we don't actually find it that often, this level of rigor in around allocating your team effectively across the high value services. And that's really a sort of the service demand um, and the, the type of intimacy required. In other words, what services are core, what do we want to partner with, what do we want to delegate and what do we want to manage is really where you can begin to overlay your services over that space and specifically looking at the demand for those services. And these are types of exercises that we do sort of repeatedly for our clients as we try and understand, well, is there some way that we can outsource aspects of your capability um, and complement you in such ways? So same as the quadrant graph in the beginning, is there stuff which is complex but highly valuable, or sorry, complex but of limited value for you as an architectural practice? Well, you're not going to know what's valuable until you map it effectively to the business goals and objectives of the organization, not to your own internal business goals and objectives. And that's the service model, and that's the motivation model aspect of designing a service. And then we produce these nice roadmaps, um, which, you know, depending upon your ability to absorb detail, um, but, you know, all of it we roll together onto one page, looking at what needs to be improved and where we can hide implicitly uh, 
bits of, of activity to improve the practice as we begin to try and move up that mandate curve. And there's some things that can occur explicitly and we can go and look for funding and budget for it, but a lot of what we need to do as an architect team is actually do it under the guise of, of certain initiatives. As you climb that mandate curve, that implicit sort of disguising technique becomes, you, know, you don't need it that often, but as the business is beginning to see the value of what the architecture place um, and activity can provide and you, know, we, you start to get actual budget for it, uh, actual budget for that activity, for building the team, for growing the team, for tackling certain activities like mergers and acquisitions and all those types of things. So that's really the journey that, that you only want to be able to get your practice to that level where you're not, not having to implicitly hide these things under different projects. And, and, and that's really just taking us through a journey of saying, well, if we've got up to um, that, that knowledge funnel that we spoke about, in which there's all of these complex problems that we need to be able to deal with. And as architects, we need to be able to drive those problems through the knowledge funnel. We need to understand the heuristics. We need to understand how we can codify those processes and create them highly repeatable um, and low risk within the organization. Well, you have to build a practice that can deliver that. You can't just do it without some formality in the architectural discipline. And that's really the, the type of journey that I've tried to take you through here different styles and techniques that work and some of them that don't as you try and build out this architectural practice. Um, so, you know, once you have an effective practice, you're now in a position to figure out, okay, um, where do they provide value to the business? So, you know, up a little and across a little according to that maturity graph, which was this one here, um, which was up, up, you know, work on my practice going up a little, improve my architectural thinking, some of the services and techniques that I provide, but then get them into the business, get the business using them. Well, the best way you're going to do that is have business take ownership of them. In other words, they were involved in some of the, uh, the original design of it, and the co-design exercises. So, so that's really um, a very quick accelerated view of, of, of where we see the, the services of the architecture taking place, especially um, when considering some of the changes that are occurring in the industry. So that's all, all for me. Thanks, Simon, over to you. Craig, thank you for that. Uh, you've clearly uh, raised some questions about the role of VA and where it sits in the business. So let's just go through a few questions. A question from Mary Ann. Should business architecture sit within the business or within technology? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we actually know the answer to that question. Um, but statistically, uh, I have a report which actually shows that the success of business architecture initiatives uh, it, it, when they are business-led, is far more successful um, and and not IT-driven. So your business architecture function should should not sit, I believe, under the CIO space. It should not sit within IT. It is not an IT discipline. Um, it's basically an MBA, an accelerated MBA type of view is how we see business architecture. So. Um, it does beg the question, though, is that, well, if business architecture is a sub-discipline of enterprise architecture, but enterprise architecture is seen as IT, um, then, well, how does that work? So we, we have seen the business architecture function sort of popping out of the enterprise architecture function purely because of, of the legacy of what EA is seen as, and it's tainted with an IT brush, so to speak, um, and then the business architects sitting within the core value chain uh, and sitting sometimes under the CIO, COO, but uh, we would recommend under the Chief Marketing Officer or the Chief Digital Officer space uh, for that particular function to sit. Thanks. A uh, question here from Mike. Um, how is the correlation between the architecture continuum and the solutions continuum typically maintained in practice in large enterprises? Well, that's an interesting question. Do I even talk on that? <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I refer to that as the bucket. And for those of you on the call who are not sure what that is, um, those, that's the, the uh, almost the logical and physical separation of your building blocks within uh, your arch the TOGA architecture framework. Uh, and what that means is that um, I design, I will use and consume as well as design building blocks and I will store them in my continuum according to certain layers and according to certain 
um, levels. Um, and I see the role of the enterprise architect, um, and specifically the governance processes on the enterprise level, we normally focus on the architectural building blocks, which is the architecture uh, continuum. Um, and we create a separation between that team and the solution architecture team, which focuses on the solution building blocks, which is a solution continuum. And there it talks to that view in which we spoke about earlier that it's less about your own discipline and more about interrelationship between disciplines, which means that the processes and governance and handoff between uh, the architectural, um, the enterprise architecture discipline and the solution architecture discipline, uh, you know, it needs to be fairly streamlined. Um, and, and really that's where I see ownership splitting. So the solution architect team deals with the solution continuum space and the architecture team deals with all your architectural building blocks above that. How you govern that through tools and processes and all the rest of that is an entirely separate discussion, but that's normally how we create an organizational separation between the two. Okay, thanks. Uh, from Brahim, uh, does uh, the architecture continuum building blocks represent capabilities required in the enterprise? Uh, yeah. Um, so remember that business is all about building blocks. So as architects, we use what's called a mechanistic metaphor. So we describe things in terms of blocks. We describe things in terms of a machine or an engine and those types of things. Um, funny enough, business doesn't see the world in that way. They see it in the form of an organic metaphor, which is a tree growing or a cloud that's constantly t changing shape. And there you can see the difference between an intuitive view of the world versus this analytical view of the world. We've got to take this sort of cloud space on the side and push it down into this sort of mechanistic world of creating blocks that are, that can create reuse out of. Um, and you know, the, the, creative, the creation of those blocks occurred in the software space in which we created modules. We created um, modules in an application, like functionality, doing like things and like data. We group those together into a bigger building block called an application. We then group it together into a bigger building block called a system. Well, we grouped, we added processes and people to that, and we grouped that together into an even bigger block called a, called a capability. Uh, well, we then added another layer to that, and we, we created bigger building blocks called cross-functional capabilities. And then we created bigger building blocks called value chains, which represented entire businesses right up to the top of the stack in which the, you know, the executives that sit on boards play with large building blocks in their entire companies. And how can they move these entire companies in different ways and mix them in different ways to create different outcomes? So the continuum is the bucket that stores all of these, these blocks so that we have a place to go to and, and create some level of reuse from. Uh, so whether you're storing software modules and application modules and clusterings of those, or whether you're storing a, a higher level, more coarse-grained collection of, of components as capabilities, that all goes into your continuum and you, you manage that across the life cycle of your projects. Okay, thank you, Craig. I'm just keeping on the time. So I think maybe this is the, the last question should be from Robert. Um, Robert's asking, what is your thoughts on the governance structure required for the new, more strategic roles that EA should be playing? Um, well, um, I suppose it's an interesting question because there's different definitions of governance structure. Um, I think I might have answered that in the talk which spoke about the, on the previous question, which spoke about where we see these disciplines actually reporting to. And <clears throat> what, what we've found quite effective is to take out that team that I spoke about, that um, hybrid team which co contains all of the disciplines, is, is to actually um, pull out a, a sponsor for business pull different individuals from business um, and then also pull all of those disciplines out of their different areas underneath uh, which have normally sat under the CIO and put them in a separate um, project-based unit within the organization and call it a business transformation unit or call it a, a, a some type of planning, integrated business planning unit. Um, and in order to not ruffle too many feathers, we've called it a project, a project that does planning for um, some type of transformational activity. And then over time, as they've shown their value, we've made it a full-time business unit. Um, and uh, you know, we've avoided a lot of the politics. And that business unit has, has reported and been quite successfully at reporting to somebody at the COO type level who has responsibility for all, tends to have responsibility for all of those types of horizontal type roles and functions. 
So, you know, that's really the sort of space that I would see it operating at, you know, but, you know, there is lots of matrix type reporting and structure that has to occur within, within there, and a matrix model is, tends to be the one that we have to all operate with as we report to, you know, a COO type, but also in the different value chain parts of the business, whether it's retail or warehousing or distribution, whatever the case might be, you know, we, we'd also have some dotted line into those particular areas, depending upon the function that you're working with. But I see it sitting within that COO space more lately as we move up into the core value chain, chief marketing officer, chief digital officer role. That's great, Craig. Thanks for that, Craig. Before we go, um, people have asked how they get copies of the slides. Where would be the best place they could do that? So we will drop them onto our slide share um, account, um, and you can pull them down there. But also, they'll be on the EA website with the recording of the webinar or point to the webinar as well as the point to the slide share um, that you can download. That's fantastic. Craig, uh, would you like to make any final comments before we uh, end today's event? I think I've spoken enough. Uh, thank you all for attending uh, and uh, I'll see you online sometime.